As many people in this room are aware, licensed vaccines are, have well-defined correlates of protection, and specifically, it's known which types of immune responses and what levels of those responses are required to be present in the blood in order to protect from disease. But because, to our knowledge, there hasn't been a spontaneous case of clearance of HIV, we don't have this understanding of what correlates are required to protect from HIV acquisition. However, we do have some educated guesses. And in of the five vaccine preventative efficacy trials that have been conducted to date, only one showed partial protection from HIV acquisition. And that was the RV144 trial of 16,000 people in Thailand in which about half of those participants um, were administered or received the AIDS vax protein vaccine at, along with the ALVAC vaccine. And after three and a half years of follow-up, there was a 31% protective effect in those people who received the vaccine. Now that level was too low for licensure, but did allow us to then start to understand which immune responses might contribute to protecting people from acquiring HIV. And in this one figure, that I'm showing you, which is a result of a large post hoc analysis of a number of different types of immune responses, it was seen that antibodies against the first and second variable loops of HIV envelope on the outside of the virus um, may have contributed to the protective effect. And you can see in the graph that individuals who mounted a higher response to the V1, V2 region had a lower probability of acquiring HIV. And this gives us a bit of a goalpost moving forward as to how we can continue to improve upon preventative HIV vaccines. I was just spent the last seven years living in Thailand working on follow-up trials to this in order to try and move forward the next generation of preventative HIV vaccines. But this section focuses on care and treatment, and we're talking about HIV vaccines that could be used in a therapeutic context in infants and children who are already infected with HIV. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more slide I wanted to show before I move on to therapeutic vaccines. In two studies in infants that were conducted a long time ago, uh, after the RV144 analysis, these authors went back and did a nice post hoc analysis to show that infants who were vaccinated with a variety of HIV envelope protein vaccines or the ALVAC vaccine that was used in the 144 trial um, were also capable of mounting immune responses to the same V1, V2 region, similar at um, similar rates to those adults in the RV144 trial. So this provides hope that we could, um, that the pediatric or the infant population it would also be amenable to preventative vaccines. But turning to the therapeutic side, um, it's likely that the immune responses we need to achieve to control HIV and those who are already infected are very different. And Dr. Goulder just gave a very nice overview of the role of CD8 T cells, um, CTL, cytotoxic lymphocytes, in controlling HIV. And that's because HIV um, it integrates into cells and, and stays, can stay latent for many years. There are also anatomic reservoirs, such as the brain, where um, HIV can be hide from the normal immune surveillance in our circulating system. And there are also specific immunologic sanctuaries. And what I've shown uh, on the right there is a picture from a, a monkey study of monkeys infected with SIV that shows that the SIV RNA is in elite controlling monkeys is actually specifically located more preferentially in the lymphoid follicles where CD8 T cells cannot access or have trouble um, gaining access. And those CD8 T cells are particularly important because I've highlighted one of a number of studies and the, there's a wealth of literature that establishes that CD8 T cells um, are required for controlling virus <coughs> from inf um, infected cells and people who are already infected with HIV. So from a therapeutic vaccine standpoint, when we talk about vaccines after infection, we want to maximize that CD8 T cell response. And there are a number of strategies in which to do that. So one primary strategy is rather than using proteins from HIV vaccines by the, um, from the HIV envelope to encode <coughs> HIV genes into other viruses, viral vectors, these viruses can then get into cells and 
um, the HIV antigens are expressed, and therefore the proteins are expressed by MHC on the cell surface, eliciting more of a CD8 T cell response. Um, there are a number of classes of viral vectors, and this list is by no means exhaustive, but um, the the POX vectors include the ALVAC that was used in the RV144 trial, and there is a wealth of clinical development being led by Janssen Pharmaceuticals now on use of adenoviral vectors, both in um, preventive, preventative vaccines and in therapeutic vaccines, um, including an ongoing trial currently in Thailand. And then lastly, replicating vectors are newer to this scene. The specifically, Dr. Lewis Picker at the University of Oregon has pioneered the cytomegalovirus CMV vaccine, which um, is unable to prevent um, HIV acquisition in monkeys when challenged. But once infected, the CMV replicating vaccines that express HIV ant antigens are able to control the uh, HIV in these monkeys. So, that is moving forward into clinical development. I'll show you just one snapshot of one result from a study by um, Dan Baruch um, in collaboration with the MHRP that um, vaccinated macaques after um, or before, sorry, after um, SIV challenge with a number of antigens and showed that the viral, those are different types of vaccines being shown at the bottom. But the point I want to make is that the, the, immune responses that correlated the best with the lowest viral load set point after challenge were CD8 T cell responses, and specifically responses to GAG. Um, and in addition to these viral vectors, there are a number of other strategies that are um, trying to optimize these responses, and people are exploring a number of different adjuvants, which are chemical compounds that modulate the innate immune response to to vaccines to try and preferentially improve different types of the immune response. And in this case, we're trying to improve CD8 T cell responses. So it's a bit of preaching to the choir in this room, but um, infants and children are not simply small adults, and there are a number of critical differences in, immune, in the immune systems that um, may either um, be less or more favorable to vaccine strategies. So um, the disadvantages are during the gestational period of pregnancy, women are exposed to foreign antigens from the father of the baby, and therefore there's a higher proportion of circulating regulatory T cells that actually dampen immune responses. Similarly, after birth, passive maternal antibodies can actually um, can interfere with immune responses, which is one of the reasons the measles vaccine is actually delayed and not administered immediately after birth. And then finally, babies have been in a sterile environment for nine months and so therefore have less of a developed immune system with exposure to multiple antigens from the environment. However, um, as nicely described by Dr. Kuhn, there are infants who have been started on early ART may have some advantages that make them better candidates for therapeutic vaccines than the adults in whom these vaccines have already been tested. Specifically, because they're started early, their immune function, B and T cell function, is relatively intact. Um, both speakers before have discussed the Mississippi baby, which is evidence that the latent reservoir is actually much smaller um, in, in people who are, have been started on ART since birth early on. And um, infants started on ART also have lowered viral diversity because of the high mutation rate of HIV that uh, adults with chronic HIV have a wide range of HIV quasi-species in their blood. And in infants, this diversity is far less. So um, <clears throat> there have been two trials to date in looking at vaccines of HIV-infected children. And uh, in ACTG218, and infants were infected with H uh, sorry, vaccinated with um, HIV envelope proteins, and which were safe and well-tolerated, no changes to CD4 counts in these infants. And a good proportion developed the cellular responses that we're, we're looking for to these vaccines, as well as antibodies to HIV envelope. In the PEDVAC trial, which was conducted in slightly older children who had been on ART um, since an early age, these, this used a different type of vaccine called the DNA vaccine. Um, again, these were safe and well tolerated with no um, clinical adverse events, but uh, and induced similar both cellular and humoral immune responses. 
However, overall, the immune responses were relatively weak. Um, but these were older trials using older antigens, and now as our knowledge of um, more optimal HIV vaccines evolved, I, th I think we'll see better responses at trials in the future. Um, and now I'll turn my attention a little bit to broadly neutralizing antibodies because there's been an explosion in the field, in the adult field at least, of um, the use of passively administered broadly neutralizing antibodies in lieu of um, looking for a vaccine that can generate a natural responses to these antibodies. The, the administration of antibodies IV in adults has been shown to reduce viral load in people, uh, adults who are chronically infected with HIV. But no single anti um, antibody has been curative to date, um, usually because of the rapid ex escape of the virus to these antibodies over time. Um, so combination trials are now going forward. I wanted to highlight one study, which is again in macaques, but is very relevant to the pediatric field because it was conducted in infant macaques who were infected with simian human immunodeficiency virus that expresses HIV envelope on the surface and therefore is amenable to um, neutralizing antibodies. And in these macaques, those who were, um, who then received repeated administrations of a combination of two antibodies that target two different portions of the HIV envelope um, had clearance of infection um, by day 14 after four administration of these combination antibodies. And I think this study provides a lot of hope that um, similar strategies may be effective in humans. And with that, there are actually trials that are now moving forward. One um, is a trial of the VRCO1 antibody, which is um, in infants who were started early in, um, with ART early. And this is a randomized study that will administer four doses of the VRCO1 antibody. Another upcoming funded study is, um, will be conducted in Botswana, arising out of investigators in Harvard, which will combine two synergistic monoclonal antibodies um, and administer them to virally suppressed early treated children. And in this case, they're actually gonna go ahead and stop antiretroviral therapy under very close supervision while continuing to administer the monoclonal antibodies. So I think that will be one exciting trial to watch. And then lastly, um, Dr. Gintanat is one of the principal investigators on a consortium of um, studies of newer HIV vaccines that include the modified vaccinia Ankara in the family of pox viruses that is known to elicit CD8 T cells and um, will be administering vaccines to children, not um, to then stop their antiretroviral therapy, but to look at the effect of vaccines on reducing the viral reservoir. So there's a lot of interesting work moving forward into humans, while in parallel, back at the bench, we continue to um, improve other aspects of broadly neutralizing antibody delivery. And in this case, I just want to highlight um, a new emerging field of, of DMABs, DNA monoclonal antibodies, which are being have had success in animal models for chikungunya, influenza, and um, Zika virus. And rather than administer the actual monoclonal antibody, um, you can administer a DNA vaccine encoding the heavy and light chains uh, for these antibodies. So we essentially then make the antibodies ourselves. And um, these are being administered not subcutaneously, but um, dermally with, via an electroporation device. And so, you know, the, the point I'm, I want to make here, rather than emphasize the details, is that we are, op especially with pediatric patients, we need to think about not just what we're administering, but how we're administering it for optimal delivery. Ultimately, of course, we all know oral administration would be ideal for kids. And then, um, in my final slide, I just want to state that we um, should never forget the adolescence. And here, I think the, the differences from adults are not so much immunologic and more legal, ethical, and regulatory. Um, the age of consent varies widely across countries and in the United States varies between states, posing challenges as to how to um, ethically administer um, an HIV vaccine trial into this population. But we shouldn't let those um, but those barriers stop us from moving forward because this population is one who's most at risk. Again, um, preaching to the choir in this room. But um, 
I think I've seen one recommendation coming from the US FDA, which is quite interesting, that states that um, when we're moving to the point of a phase three vaccine trial to test in adults for efficacy, we should include parallel arms to test safety of the same regimen in, ad in adolescents. And I'm aware of at least one pharmaceutical company that is planning that type of strategy to move their vaccine down to 15 to 18 year olds. So overall, I think this is a time of great hope for vaccines and broadly neutralizing antibodies in the pediatric population. And I um, think that the story will be continued over time. Thank you.